All right. Um, well, it's a privilege, actually, as well as a pleasure to welcome you to the sacred circle, really, of the United Lodge of Theosophists in San Diego. And I say that advisedly because anytime individuals gather together as sincere students of Theosophia or the divine wisdom, anytime they do that, it becomes consecrated in the sense that it becomes part of the wonderful uh, orbit of the uh, theosophical movement, and therefore it's contributing to the well being of the human race in some sense. So when we gather every Saturday, it's important to appreciate the fact that in the sense we form an instant sangha, an instant community of people who are sincere searchers, seekers of wisdom, who raise questions, who think, who reflect, who wonder, who attempt to connect what they understand to practice during the week, and therefore elevate their understanding, purify their heart, and become better students as time progresses. So this is one of the beautiful things about these Saturday meetings, that they really do provide an opportunity for us to connect to each other as individuals. Whether we speak or don't speak is not the point. The point is our common concern, our focus, our attention, our admiration, our respect for each other and for the divine philosophy is what really enriches and makes holy what we do. Now, before we turn to the, today's discussion uh, by Maria Garcia of, the, um, of mind control, the culture of concentration, I would like to point out to you that next week about upcoming meetings, so you be aware of it, uh, on July 30th, next Saturday, we will hear a talk and consider the rose. Um, the following Saturday on August the 6th, there will be the beacon light, a wonderful article by HBB on the beacon light. There's also a wonderful article on the rose uh, because it's a symbol article. Then on August the 13th, the service of humanity, um, um, which of course is a very heartbeat and pulse of any sincere student of the theosophical philosophy, the service of humanity. And then on August the 20th, we'll get to hear that luminous figure from the Renaissance, Pico della Mirandola, who's responsible for founding together with Ficino, um, the uh, Platonic Academy in Florence. Uh, which was really a kind of golden age um, uh, reflection during the Renaissance and really was a seedbed and something very mm -hmm. seminal for the Renaissance and the future. And of course, out of that came his oration on the dignity of man. Uh, but it's just a very wonderful, uh, he's a very remarkable individual. Um, and we salute all great individuals of all cultures, past and present, who contributed to human understanding and to human, um, human um, um, well-being um, and human enrichment. Now, um, we're going to turn our attention this evening in what we call our Aquarian series um, to mind control, uh, the uh, culture of concentration. And just to give you a little, little overview of um, the, uh, the Aquarian series as a, as a longtime student of, of the Theosophy and the United Lodge of Theosophists. This really resonates to me, uh, these themes. Um, they go back to the Lodge in Santa Barbara, where Raghavan and Nandini Iyer originated a lot of different modes of presenting the teachings and getting people involved. Um, and one of them was the Aquarian Almanac. And the Aquarian Almanac, what it required, what it did was it set a theme for every week. That theme corresponded with the talk given at the lodge. So Raghavan and Nandini visualized the entire 52 talks for a given year. So the talks mm -hmm. for the year were set so that when the Almanac came out, the themes it had for the week would correspond with the actual talk. 
Furthermore, students were encouraged to find quotes from philosophers, physicists, poets, um, uh, artisans, artists, um, uh, free thinkers, <laughs> you name it. Uh, we drew from the vast reservoir, what he used to call the heritage of humanity, so that you could look at a theme for the week. And after the night's talk by students, you had this during the week that you could refer to the almanac. Each day had its own quote, and it referenced various heroes and heroines uh, in the past, their birth date, their death date. So you'd suddenly have before you this wonderful quote that you could stop and pause during the day. And if you reflected on it, it would resonate with the theme of the week. And therefore it would be an uplifting moment and also a moment in which you could release something that was pure, purifying, elevating, helpful, clarifying, who knows on the deeper planes what things are really like, but nonetheless, that made sense. So it was a, an opportunity for students anywhere and everywhere uh, to be able to, at different points during the week, different points during the day, meditate, contemplate, pause for a moment, and look at a theme for the week, and then look at the quote for the day. And in some way and somehow, there was a golden thread of connection and interconnection. And it would allow you to have a better understanding of the talk you listen to and we're now assimilating during the week. So it all wove together this wonderful fabric. Uh, and students had multiple opportunities to uh, purify their mind, to regain their stasis and, and have a sense of calmness and a sense of rendering gentle service to all that lives, which of course is the Theosophy School chant, the children chant every Sunday. Um, so anyway, uh, having said that, the quote for the week and the, um, the uh, quotation that went for the entire week, mind control was as follows. Owing to the enormous elasticity of the mind, it is capable of tremendous expansion as well as intense focus, from Hermes. Then I'll read you what would have been the quote for today from HBB. The human brain is simply the canal between two planes, the psycho-spiritual and the material, through which every abstract and metaphysical idea filters from the monastic down to the lower human consciousness. Now, this is kind of a thread within what Maria is now going to be doing. Maria Garcia is going to summarize, extract various points from Judge's article in the Culture of Concentration. And so Maria will be presenting those for us to consider for the remainder of our time. So Maria, feel free. you. Hi, everyone. My name is Maria, and I'll be presenting on William Q. Judge article, uh, The Culture of Concentration and the Practice of Yoga to Control the Mind. I uh, will approach this presentation by asking questions on the process and of the practices of of, and of the practice of concentration and how it works. My intention in using this uh, approach is mainly to highlight the important points of each paragraph and use judge's perspective to answer each question. At uh, times I will be, I will use direct quotes, but others I will do my best to paraphrase judge's message on the topic of mind control and the culture of concentration. So the first question that I asked when I was reading this article was, what is um, the self and can it be cultured? Uh, culture of concentration is also referred to by the term self-culture. This term can be misleading to those who are not aware of the profound meaning of the word self. According to Judge, the term self-culture seemed to be working well to express the practice referred to by those who desire to know the truth. Yet this term is inaccurate from a theosophical perspective because in theosophy, the word self is understood to be in alignment with the Indian texts. For example, in Indian texts, the self is seen as a portion of the eternal spirit and it is known as Ishvara. That explains that in chapter 15 of the Bhagavad Gita, the self is described as the eternal spirit that in this world of life attracts the heart and the five senses which belong to nature. 
Um, the self is described as Ishvara, or the Supreme Spirit within the human body, and also called the spectator and admonisher, sustainer, enjoyer, great Lord, and also highest soul. And again, the supreme eternal soul, even when existing within or connected with the body is not polluted by the actions of the body. Therefore, the self or Ishvara cannot be taught by the body because it transcends the physical body or physical plane. In other words, the self is beyond the most elevated understanding that man has about truth because that understanding, understanding is incomplete or limited in men during the physical manifestation. Uh, furthermore, uh, in this same Indian books, this same spirit is called, again, the self, which in Sanskrit is Atmanam, Atmana and Pashya, which means raise the self by the self. This can be found in the Upanishads, where the self is referred to as Ishvara of the Bhagavad Gita. Also, the term self-culture, when used in English, can mislead the student if not understood from the Indian standpoint. Students must keep in mind that the self, which is in its very nature, eternal, unchangeable, and unpolluted by any action cannot be culture. So what is meant by saying culture is the practice follow, is that the practice follow should lead the individual to mirror and fulfill the mandates of that old wise Ishvara or portion of the Supreme Spirit within us. It can be understood as if man is continually, continuously being instructed by the Supreme Spirit or teacher, and at the same time, he's continuously learning from his own experience in the physical realm. So the actions of men should reflect or be in alignment with that portion in him of the Supreme Spirit in order to eventually raise himself and become one with it. Stuart recommends that the term self-culture must be changed to one that accurately describes the meaning of self and does not require a constant ex explanation. It should be a term that when making use of making use of it, mm. doesn't ask for further explanations, such as to hourly declare <laughs> or inwardly admit and reassure that the self or Ishvara is unchangeable and cannot be cultured. Also, Judge mentions that an that another reason to get rid of the term self-culture is because it assumes a certain degree of selfishness and separates the person from the rest of the human brotherhood. However, judge states that the only way we can use the term self-culture without contradiction is by admitting that we selfish, selfishly, selfish, selfishly desire to cultivate ourselves, even though it contradicts the theosophical idea that the personal self must be uprooted. Therefore, he suggests that the new term should include three essential things in the action, that is the instrument, the act and the agent, as well as knowledge itself, the thing to be known or done, and the person who knows. Now the next question or statement is, if self-culture self is too confusing in describing the process of evolution of consciousness, then what term can be used to express this in a more encompassing manner? Judge, judge states that the term that can be used instead of subculture is concentration, called in the Indian books yoga, yoga, which means union. This term clearly expresses the union of the higher aspect of the person with the supreme being, or can be understood as the object of a spiritual knowledge, knowledge in the supreme being. Now, what is yoga? Judge explained the two great divisions of yoga found in the ancient books, Hatha Yoga, and Raj Yoga. The first one, Hatha Yoga, is the action of subduing bodily desires through which certain powers can be developed. The state that this practice includes body postures which aid the work of concentration and breathing techniques that bring changes in the system together with other devices. He mentions that Hatha Yoga methods are set forth in detail in some treaties and without a doubt the practice of them can lead to attaining various abnorm abnormal powers. In addition, Judge explains the risks, especially for Western people who might be attracted by the novelty of it and after realizing how it offers physical results. The, risk, the risks are that when a person tries to practice these things without a guru or a teacher, even if he follows the rules, the individual can arouse influence that will harm him. 
Also, following an unguided practice can bring the natural functions of the individual to certain states, bringing him beyond limits that he might not be able to control. The risk of practicing Hatha Yoga without having complete knowledge of it can potentially cause serious harm to the individual. Judge states that few Western people are by nature fitted for the continuous and difficult labor on the mental and natural planes. Hatha Yoga is a difficult practice and must be brought to the point of mastery and success in order to prevent undesirable consequences. In addition, what is gained from practicing Hatha Yoga belongs to the material and semi-material plane or the body and does not transcend to what is eternal, but is lost at death. Judge makes reference to a Bhagavad Gita verse that says, all of these indeed being verse and sacrifice have their sins destroyed by, this, by these sacrifices. But he alone reaches union with the Supreme Being who eats of the ambrosia left from a sacrifice. He further explains that Hatha Yoga represents the mere sacrifice itself, whereas in the second and the most important type of yoga, it's Raj Yoga of culture of the culture of concentration is the ambrosia arising from the sacrifice, which brings the perfection of a spiritual cultivation and leads to nirvana. Raj Yoga unifies the man with the Supreme Being. As a result of the perfection of concentration, the person is able to use the knowledge that is within reach, but is often disregarded because a person in its natural state is unaware of it. Okay, the next question is what sustains the physical forms that we claim to understand? Judge mentions that what we usually call knowledge is basically only an intellectual comprehension of the outside forms assured by certain realities. He gives us an example on how minerals and metals are classified based on their material phenomena and empirical acquisition. The mechanical and chemical knowledge of metals and minerals is just an expression of that invisible force behind them, which leads and brings forth the crystalline forms of them. Men observe the crystallized forms and collect the data based on what they are able to measure, yet the data collected is incomplete because they are they they or the scientists are only considering the crystalline, crystalline or manifested aspects of the minerals and metals. They are not taking into account the ener the invisible energies to the eye that are continuously and actively sustaining the visible forms. Judge explains how a new theory has arisen and come near to the truth. This theory states that we do not know matter in its entire, entirety, and that we only understand the portion that is being presented to us by crystallized matter. Yet the crystallized matter has further properties in its ethereal, etherealized state and can only be apprehended by the underdeveloped senses the science does not accept. When the ethere eth etherealized matter manifests into physical forms, we give it names such as gold, wood, iron, stone, and so forth. Furthermore, the knowledge of understanding of what is manifested can also be applied when we try to understand men and women. We base our understanding of men on the outer phenomena. Judge explains how we assign certain characters to people based on their con conduct, yet that is only provisional and, and cannot say we know his good or bad qualities because that is only based on the observation, observations of experiences on the physical phenomena. Yet the person is more than those characteristics, just like in metals and minerals. The person has an ethereal aspect that can only be understood by the underdeveloped senses that need to unfold in man. We can't understand others in its fullness, just like we cannot understand our own composition. Okay, um, the next question is, how can the power of discernment be att attained? Jun judge states that we must have the power of discernment, which will enable us to know whatever is desired to be known. Teachers of occultism affirm that this power can be acquired by cultivating concentration. Judge makes reference to the inner man, which is not the higher self or jvara, but is what we call the soul, astral man or vehicle. He mentions that the inner man or soul has to mature, just like the organs in the body do in order to fulfill their functions. In the immature soul, the latent powers and peculiarities ascribed to the astral body are still latent or only very partially developed in the majority of people. 
in the process of discernment, the body, soul, and spirit are in a way co-working for the ultimate goal, which is to learn the truth and become one with the eternal spirit. Judge puts them in order um, and sets the, these three different compositions of men as a base for further discussion. And it's as follows. The visible physical body is first, then the inner men, the soul is second, and the spirit itself, Ishvara, is the third. Now, um, uh, we know that we have a portion of the eternal spirit and we have some sort of understanding of the physical body, but, but um, we can ask ourselves, where is the soul located? Judge mentions that the second or inner being is in this inextricably entangled in the body, cell for cell and fiber for fiber. He gives an example of, on how the fiber in the mango can hardly be distinguished or separated from the pulp. In the same manner, the soul is in a way one with the physical body. The inner being or soul cannot do much away from the physical body and is always influenced by it. It is not easy to leave the physical body in Rome in the double. According to the occultist, for the soul to leave the body at will and roam around the world is a great task. It requires immense dedication. And so the person needs to practice, practice concentration in order to separate the inner self from the physical body. The awakening of the latent powers will happen through the practice of concentration. And gradually the soul will be able to step out of the body. It is not easy since the second, the inner self needs to separate itself from the first, the physical body and its component components such as the blood, tissues, bones, bile, and skin. And where does the ethereal form or body travels to? Judge mentions that it is not true that when we are asleep, we leave the physical body and travel in the country and visit our friends and enemies and indulge in earthly joys. Most of us remain close to our physical forms or bodies. However, the person who has worked and acquired some amount of concentration will be able to leave the body, but the temporary separation of the inner self and the body is done by not, by not that many people. It is possible to experience different states of consciousness and go away over miles of country, but that can only be done when an ethereal form is built and the individual has learned how to use its powers. Judge tells us that the ethereal body has its own organs, which are the essence or real basis of the senses described by man. He continues by saying that all the eye, ear, and all other organs have their inner master and flow from the spirit or Jvara. Moreover, he mentions that the way it works, it's that the spirit approaches the object of sense by proceeding over the organs of sense. If the spirit withdraws, the organs cannot be used, just like it happens with a sleepwalker in which the eyes or the organ of sense it are opened and seem to be in use, yet the person is not seeing anything, therefore is not registering the experience. Okay, um, next question is how and where does the building of the ethereal form begins to develop? Judge mentions that the inner and outer organs are intricately connected and it is hard to tell them apart. However, this begins to separate when concentration starts and man begins to duplicate his powers. The organs of the physical body continue with their designated functions on the physical plane without being affected. While the newly awakened organs also begin their functions separate from the physical organs on their own plane. Judge explains how in some cases, some parts of the body are developed beyond the rest. For example, he mentions that sometimes the inner head alone is developed and the person can see or hear clairvoyantly or cloudy audiently. In other cases, the inner hand can be developed allowing an individual experience that belongs to that plane. Also, he says that when this rare cases happen, the person will experience partially that what is directly associated with that awakened organ. It will be incomplete and will be missing from the qualities of perception of the organs that have not been awakened. That is needed in order to have a full experience in the ethereal realm. Judge compares this incompleteness by saying that it will be like a two-dimensional being 
that doesn't know what uh, doesn't know what three dimensional beings know, or like ourselves compared to four dimensional beings. Okay, um, then next question is, what can be observed in the course of growth of this, of this ethereal body? Judge tells us um, what is expected to be observed when growing the ethereal body. He mentions that in the beginning, the ethereal body begins by having a cloudy appearance with certain centers of energy cost, cost but the initial state that can correspond to the brain, heart, lungs, spleen, liver, and so on. The ethereal body follows the course of development as a solar system, which is go governed and influenced by the solar system which the world belongs to and where the being may be incarnated. He clarifies that within us, it is a, um, with, he clarifies that within us, it is governed by um, our own solar orb. As the practice of concentration continues, the body begins to develop and differentiate and the ethereal organs begin to appear. The awakened organs must be used and the person will gradually begin to have control over them. Judge gives the example or just like, gives the example of just like a baby needs to begin to creep before he can walk and walk before he can run. So the ethereal man must do the same. It's a process. What are those four obstacles found in the process of developing an ethereal form and how they affect the person? Judge states that there are obstacles in which the nebulous forming body is violently shaken or pull apart or burst into fragments that fly back to the body and go back to the initial state it was before practicing concentration. For this reason, uh, Judge mentions that sages Jewel upon the need of calmness. calmness. The first obstacle, obstacle, as a person allows himself to get angry, the ethereal body feels it and trembles in the center and pulls apart up to then, coherent particle. If anger continues, the ethereal body will disintegrate and go back to the natural place in the body. Anger creates negative effects on the ethereal body and can even disintegrate. And just like in the beginning, it will take a long time for it to regenerate again. Judge mentions that there is no righteous anger, even when the person feels that things were not fair or if the, or if the person feels that his rights have been unjustly um, invaded. It does not matter. The energy of anger is the same even when our perception of justice differs. He states that anger is a force that will work itself in its appointed way and should be avoided in all cases. In order to do so, the person must cultivate charity and love or absolute toleration. The second obstacle that can interfere in the creation and the development of the ethereal body is envy. Judge mentions that envy is not mere trifle that produces no physical result. It has a powerful action, as strong in its own field as that of anger. Envy causes the ethereal body to take a cloudy and unpleasant color and impedes its further development. Also, envy attracts thousands of evil or hostile beings that rush towards, towards and gravitate around the student, causing to awake or bring with them evil passions. The third obstacle that can negatively affect the ethereal body is vanity. According to judge, vanity represents the great illusion of nature. It brings up the soul, all sorts of erroneous, erroneous or evil pictures or both and drags the judgment so way that once more anger or envy will enter or such course be pursued that violent destruction by outside causes falls upon the being. He mentions a case related to him in which a person was far advanced on his concentra concentration practice and evolution of his ethereal body, but allowed vanity to rule. Then the inner side of this person was presented with great images and ideas, which in turn attracted to his sphere a multitude of elementals not well known by the student. 
This elemental seriously attacked and surrendered the ethereal form of the person. This action caused the ethereal body of the person to explode and seriously damage and alter the man's whole nature. As a result, the person committed awful excesses and died in a madhouse. This hindrances can seriously destroy the ethereal body and damage men's nature. When confronting this obstacle, it is of high importance for the student to cultivate selflessness and poverty of heart. Advice given by Jesus and Buddha. The fourth obstacle is fear. Fear does not affect the ethereal and the nature of men like anger, envy, and vanity do. This hindrance is caused by ignorance and it disappears as the student knowledge increases. Judge mentions that its effect on the ethereal form is to shrivel it, shrivel it up or coagulate and contract it. However, the ethereal form of the student expands when fear is counteracted by the acquisition of knowledge. I'm gonna move uh, to part number two. And the question is who can succeed in the practice of concentration? In the second part of culture of concentration, judge states that success in this matters cannot be attained if the seeker sporadically attempts it. He mentions that the student who practices concentration has to have an inner desire, take a firm stance and maintain it. In occultism, success is not understood as the 19th century students think of it, in which the success is attained by studying and retaining information. In other words, it's not about the information attained which indeed helps in the process, but it's more about the student's desire for inner development. The practice should be approached with honesty, consistency, and willingness to seek for the ultimate truth. Next question is, which type of yoga directs the seeker to the higher virtues of man? Judge states that the practice of Raja Yoga, yoga sorry, is the one that directs the students to virtue and altruism and not physical motions, postures, and recipe relations solely to the present personality. Judge says that it is important for the seeker to know that virtue cannot be ignored and should be part of their lives, along with the understanding of the philosophical basis. He continues by saying that the seeker cannot succeed completely in the culture of concentration by only the practice of virtue. However, the practice of virtue in this life can help the seeker ac accumulate some merit, which can cause a person to be born in a wise family in future incarnations and begin the process of concentration. Furthermore, the person can also be born into a family of devotees or, or those who, have, who, are, who are advanced on the path. Next question is, are the virtues and understanding understanding of ourselves given, given, or do we have to do our work to earn them? According to judge, the culture of con concentration requires a lot of work. The seeker must work to attain it. He says, great stores of knowledge must be found and seized. The kingdom of heaven is not to be had for the asking. It must be taken by violence. And the only way in which we can gain the will and the power is to the seize and hold, hold is by acquiring the virtues on the one hand and immediately understanding ourselves on the other. In the process, it is important to be knowledgeable and wise to understand that the work of concentration is an inward practice and not an outside preparation. Individual selfless work, keeping in mind compassion and altruism will allow the seeker to gradually attain greater knowledge whereas selfish work and the search for personal achievement will lead the person to serious harm. Judge gives the example of Eliphaz Levi, who wrote many good things, but practiced ne necromancy in trying to call for the shade of Apollonius. When practicing these things, it can, it can be harmful to those who indulge in it because they may be able to use certain energies, but do not possess the full understanding of those energies the true masters or adepts possess the knowledge and wisdom to work with the natural law and have discernment on doing the right action. And judge states that, and the foolish dabbing by American theosophists with practices of the yogis of India that are not one eighth 
understood and which in themselves are inadequate will lead to much worse results than the apocryphal attempt recorded by Elifa, Elifa Levi. It is very important for the seeker to practice the culture of concentration with the highest ideal, with the highest ideal in cultivating his virtues in a, in a selfless manner to unite with the one. Judge recommends for us to examine our present possessions and grow our present powers and mental machinery. Taking this approach can lead us to the best results that we can attain in our own effort in this incarnation. And this concludes my presentation slash summary. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, uh, Uriah. Um, that was splendid, beginning with questions and then going through judge with a fine tooth comb and pulling out all his points and arguments. Very good, because that was a very important topic, not only in his time, but also in our own, in our culture of in which we can characterize it by distraction. Um, almost everything is aimed in our culture at distraction of one or another kind. And it's no wonder that we have such a problem with really being able to concentrate or to elaborate what we concentrate on. So that was just uh, very helpful. Um, and so now we can turn it over to, let me expand the thing so I can see people here. Um, Yes, okay. So feel free to ask a question or to make a comment or to cite an example that you think is very helpful in clarifying and understanding mind control. Uh, Judy. Can you, you're, you've got to turn on your mic. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, Jim and Maria, a wonderful introduction and talk. My question is about the meaning of yoga. As Patanjali says, let the exposition of, or surely the exposition of yoga or concentration is about to be made. And I have was told constantly by my teacher at UC Santa Barbara, Professor Gerald Larson, that yoga does not mean union, that it means uh, like yoke, or has the root, same root as yug, circle, and that it has to do with discipline, concentration, and that the union uh, with the highest self we can at least imagine on our plane, and maybe a goal of it, but there's also isolated mysticism and uh, what uh, also might be called copulative mysticism or, or nihilistic mysticism. I mean, these are academic terms, but can we really define yoga as union in any way or isn't it more basically that concentration, which will, as you so well explained, will rid us of the vices of ambition, anger, and hatred as the Buddhists talk about the three gates of hell, especially anger, which we're so prone to in this society in this day and age. So thank you, if you could answer that. Uh, Maria, do you have anything to mention or do you want me to make a comment? Yeah, you can comment, Jim. Thank you. Uh, the, Judy, let me ask you a question. When you said that your instructors insisted that it had to do with yoking rather than union. That's Professor Larson. He was yes, very uh, adamant about it. He and Nandini fine, I remember have I, arguments about I, 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 the Shanka. Yes, yeah, so they were very good friends of course. Yeah, I, I remember that he, he insisted on that point. Could you clarify yes. us, for us what might be meant by, what is the distinction between yoking and union? Yes, that, that's a very good question. Well, uh, according to Larson, yoking was like discipline, like you'd put a yoke on an oxen in order to discipline the oxen. I've seen water buffaloes in India and they would just take off unless they were yoked. 
that this was at audio it was actually quite funny <laughs> yeah. when one got loose one day so you want to discipline the tendency of the mind to just go like a monkey and from okay. topic right. to topic yeah. and so in in larson's view of yoga was discipline that's that's what it meant and one of its its goals like as in vedanta which he didn't subscribe to he was strictly shankya was union with the higher self with brahman mm -hmm. or whatever you wish to call it all but right he all was right. so about its concentration me. yes that's the way i understood it but you would think that um oh robert has his hand up robert do you have something to say about this yeah well in reading uh I, the 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 Upanishad that has to do with Nachiketas, I can't remember yes, uh -huh. what Nachiketas, uh huh. Uh, which that. Upanishad that is? Kata, but, uh, Kata Upanishad. Kata. Kata. Yeah. Kata Upanishad. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, in that, at least in the translation, the term yoga was used both ways. Both in the terms of the discipline of yoga and in the sense of union with the self. So that was, because I'd heard about this argument, okay? So that's why it stood out to me when I read it. <laughs> well, yeah, that makes sense to me. I appreciate that point because how can you speak of the possibility of union? Uh, because it, to, to seek union is to presuppose a separation. And so if you wish to remove the separation, then you have to engage in a discipline. And the discipline, don't forget Yama, the god of death, who deals with Nachiketas, that has to do with discipline. It has to do with the Yamas. It has to do with disciplines. So uh, it's a kind of death involved in terms of, of, of the, of the uh, dissolving, so to speak, of the narrow sense of oneself and of others. Um, so that's a deeper discipline. The Hatha Yoga discipline is really external, even though it pertains to the body, and even though you can speak of other aspects of it, it doesn't really originate in a motive um, that is sustainable because it's a mo and it doesn't involve an, an inner discipline in the way in which Raja Yoga does. Um, so, but yoking, sure, as a discipline, um, absolutely. Gandhi said one of the things that distinguishes a human being from the animal kingdom is that animals work on instinct, but human beings are in the position to actually discipline and restrain themselves. And actually, someone is actually more admirable who engages in restraint often than someone who does something positive, because restraint is extremely important uh, to release uh, and to make it possible for us to flourish and uh, cultivate the higher virtues. So there must be both restraint and cultivation. Um, and um, yeah, anyway, he, Gandhi was, uh, was uh, keen on this point. Um, and often people are, don't praise each other when they don't do something, which is often just as important as doing something. But yeah, so how could you have the deeper union of the mystical that you were referring to, Judy? this self-transcending oceanic experience, which is also illuminating. It's not simply a feeling, but it's a feeling that also goes with illumination, realization, understanding that is so profoundly deep that it is a joy uh, because it makes you aware of the incredible dignity of every single being on the earth. Um, and how could that not be joyous? And how could then the discipline not be natural after that point? How can it not be worth everything? As a great teacher once said in one of the uh, judge articles, actually, he said, it is a difficult path. A spiritual path is arduous, but it's worth every step because it becomes self-validating as you move down the path and up the path and down and up and gain your ballast and gain your perspective and gain your understanding, it becomes easier and easier. And you become so aware 
of the wonderful meaning of unity, of union. Uh, but it involves continual yoking and union um, because there are always plateaus to be, to be won. Anyway, so that's an interesting question about yoking and union. I think Robert hit the mark. It, they're both involved. Uh, so Larson shouldn't have overemphasized that if he did, nonetheless. So other questions, comments, further thoughts? May I react on, uh, on uh, your question? Yes. May I react on Julia? Yes, 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 do, do, do or, I'm or, sorry. Or just on, uh, uh, Monica also wants to react on Julia's question. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time with my hearing on this thing. Can someone just reiterate? Mon Monica, should I go? Um, yes. Monica had her hand up first. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, thank you. Well, first of all, Maria uh, and Jim, thank you very much. This was a great presentation. And uh, I think over the years of all the articles uh, by Mr. Judge, this is the one that has come up the most. Um, so I, I really appreciate having this time to really zero in on it um, in this form. But I just had a couple of things. One is, um, it's very odd to me in the sort of pop world of uh, Hatha Yoga, the first, explan the, the first word given about the explanation of what yoga means is union. But I don't remember ever hearing union with what? And so it just seems to me <laughs> that uh, a very important part of why we would engage in this uh, is left out. And so uh, once again, theosophy comes to the rescue. But there, uh, another thing that I wanted to say, um, having uh, learned about um, Tsongkhapa, who talked about his teacher, um, who, the one, he had plenty of teachers, but the one who would be with him throughout his whole life. He is, was Rendawa. Um, and he, he made note of a moment when one of the monks asked him what Rendawa was like. And his response was, uh, since the first day I started studying with him, I have not had one day of anger, um, which, um, it, it, it says uh, in the book that he filled up with tears at, at the very idea of, the, of such a thing happening. Of course, we, we, we would know that he earned it, like we have to earn everything. But that uh, uh, really stood out for me. But obviously, anger is the, like, the number one. I've also remembered hearing someone at the lodge saying that, uh, once you have a fit of anger in terms of this path and the discipline, you've got to start all over again. So couldn't possibly be easy. So I just wanted to offer those ideas. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you very much, Monica. Uh, that was very helpful. It's, it's important too, we can see why, um, why the philosophy is so important because the philosophy encourages us to look at anything and everything that comes to our attention in our culture or that comes to mind and seems to us to be desirable or good, um, to really question it and to use the mind and the rational element in the mind in a way that's compatible with spiritual unfoldment. Because asking questions about anger, which our, our culture can encourage you to do, self-expression, therapeutics. They give you all kinds of reasons why it can be healthy to do that. And so one has to step back from that and say, now, really? What, in what way is anger therapeutic or helpful? Well, there's righteous anger. Certainly to be angry over injustice being done, wrong being done, harm being done, that seems to be a basis for which you can say your anger is justified. It's morally justified. Why wouldn't that be healthy? If you keep up all this anger inside of yourself, you're gonna be twisted in knots. 
and you and and so therefore you can see that's very seductive. Uh, so one has to step back and say, now okay, but is there another way of dealing with it? Because really, when you question, what does an anger explosion accomplish if what you're trying to do is right or wrong? In what way does that make justice more likable? I mean, more practical. In what way is the person committing the wrong or the injustice going to respond to you? So when you start examining it and becoming more philosophical and thoughtful about it and monastic about it and thinking out its possible implications and consequences, you begin to understand why Gandhi said, the life of truth and nonviolence is a life of continual thought and exploration of the meaning of things and a reminder that don't slip into passive states of mind. Don't be just a reactive person. So that's all That's all to the good, very much appreciated. Now, I don't know who was up next because I don't, whether it's truth or the other gentleman who had his hand up. Uh, I don't see him. Uh, so, truth? You know, there's a question of orientation and natural disposition in terms of some people are more abstract and other people are more grounded. And so uh, it seems that if someone is really based and, and, and kind of focused on the, the grounded end of the spectrum, they may have difficulty um, with the ethereal um, part of themselves. And so my question is, um, it occurred to me while you're speaking that the virtues may have some bearing on navigating the spectrum between the, the grounded and the um, abstract. And uh, so I was wondering like, uh, what you think of that, and, and especially in terms of children, like their children have a natural disposition. Uh, disposition, we, we, we shouldn't assume in my opinion that a children is not like centered in the ethereal, that they don't have any ethereal, so to speak, body developed. But, you know, but well, what do you say? Uh, well, that's that's a challenging question. Um, we also, I want to mention a kind of caveat too. It's it's I think it's it's tempting because we read what judge says about well anger and you shatter your astral. And one is not going to question what Judge says because he was an adept and always working to help us understand out of compassion. But I mean, there's anger and there's anger. There are little things of anger we have. If we catch it and correct it and, and apologize, that's true. Nature doesn't care about so much about, about the reasons why. But it is important as a moral agent uh, to not be too focused on to be more focused on what you're talking about, the virtue, than it is about what's the condition of the astral body. Um, what I mean by that is, is if we focus on the plane of what's important, then other things will, in, in, in time, they will, they will naturally flower on their own and you will have more self-control. Um, so to focus not on developing the astral, but on developing the virtues, while judge says that's not the only thing, but it is important. It helps to bridge the gap between theory and practice, between the abstract and the concrete. If you want to do good, how can you do good unless you have some motive to do good? And how can you do good unless you have some patience? And how can you do good unless you have detachment about the consequences of your actions to do good? They all interface and they move from the abstract to the concrete from the ideal to the practical and back from the practical to the ideal because you learn through mistakes and you learn through getting things right. So there's a dynamic there that goes. And one of the simple things with children is you get them to take, take joy in learning and in being responsible. And it doesn't have to be a heavy handed thing at all. You want the joy in doing things and the sense of they get, oh, oh I know that now and I can do that now. And so we encourage and praise them. And they then find a natural desire to do well what they do and to do things for others. And one of the big things pointed out that's lacking in modern education of children is, and the Dalai Lama was strong on this, and it's a lot in the hermetic teaching, is teach something about the alpha heart, not just about the alpha mind. We have to have children who have a connection with their communities, feels part of a civil community. 
One of the things I saw that was delightful once at local television in Santa Barbara is there was a kindergarten class that basically developed the city of Santa Barbara in their room. And then they had the children learn all about the city and the, being a policeman and being this and being that. And so they ended up really loving doing it. Um, and they felt they were a part more of a community. And that's a simple thing, but it just was an interesting little experiment they did. Uh, at any rate, yeah, the, the, uh, the ground, being grounded, the ground can change as you move up in altitude because the abstract becomes more real. And we have a sense of how to deal with the terrain of the practical, but it requires the virtues to bridge, a rainbow bridge between the celestial and the terrestrial. Monica? I forgot there was just one more thing I wanted to ask. It jumped out at me reading the article because uh, uh, it just, it was so surprising when Mr. Judd said that the kingdom of, he of heaven must be taken by violence. Yes. And, and I know, uh, I, I'm sure he never once used his words just off the cuff and haphazardly. So yes. there was, there's something in the meaning of that word. And I thought maybe somebody could talk about that. Yes, does anyone have some suggestions to make about what could judge a man by the kingdom of heaven must be taken by violence? Was this a statement from Jesus? I think he meant you have to fight for it, in a sense. And I think Truth has a comment. His hand's been up. No, that was from before, I think. Um, okay. So you, what, what was, Judy, you said you had, you had to fight for it. Well, you know? yes, I think that's what Jesus, I thought about that too, and I... I, I had students who, who thought that that justified the use of violence against each other as in a war, you know, when I said, no, he doesn't, couldn't possibly mean that in the context of his other teachings, but I think he meant that like a warrior, you're going to have to fight for it every day and not just passively say, oh, it's going to come through grace or the guru is going to yeah, conferred on, on me or something of that sort. It, passivity is absolutely out with a con culture of concentration. Mm -hmm. We have to be totally self-responsible. Yeah. Uh, it's almost as though you, it, to, in terms of the path, you almost have to embody all the virtues of all the forecast. You have to be concerned with service. You have to be resourceful. You have to be courageous and you have to be calm and devoted to your, your, your uh, end in view, which is, a, mm -hmm. which is the, to, to live to benefit mankind is the first yeah. step. So it's you have great to all, all four. Yeah, that's very interesting. It's a great point about yoga, Jim. Yeah. I'm sorry, what? That's a great point about Raja Yoga. Oh, yeah. The, the, the no. original idea of the forecast in, in the Veda, I think, had to do with that, not the horror that did develop in the social structure of India. That's very interesting. Other thoughts, other questions, other comments? Would you like to hear a true story about concentration? Absolutely, truth. But yes, I would like to hear that story. I was just going to say that the the heaven it refers to the more ethereal heaven, heaven the spectrum, what? so to speak. What did you say? Oh, uh, just in, in regards to taking heaven by force. Uh huh. Um, that that's you know I mean there are other traditions like in the Islamic tradition of jihad, which is really the inner yeah, conquering right. of yourself, and, and also uh -huh. the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, battle which is these are all aspects of ourselves so it's um the heavens is according to elvin boyd kuhn is associated with the element air and fire which is the sun which is the um the mental and the spiritual yeah the, the, you know it's interesting you mentioned again about the gita which judges too but really 
the, the Gita gives us the quintessential archetype of this whole problem of mind control, doesn't it? In the third chapter, he speaks about Arjuna says, what is it that makes us do things seemingly against our will? All of us experience this thing called, quote, weakness of will. And, the, and Plato addressed it in one way. But so what does, Arjuna, what does Krishna say in the next chapter? He says, seek this wisdom by what? He gives you fourfold criteria. Doing first of all, service. First of all, he says, Krishna does say, yes, Arjuna, it is difficult, but it can be done practice but okay judy now what is the fourfold criteria that krishna gives for gaining wisdom well uh doing service strong search questions and humility and the wise who see the truth the meeting with the inner eye will yeah. communicate it unto me, to me knowing which thou shalt never again fall into error i truly do i swear it O son of clinty i think that's the judge rendering yeah, that's wonderful. You quoted, I mean, that's just beautiful quote. That That is Krishna's, in a sense, answer to the question. And what is important to recognize, too, um, is when he's, Krishna speaks about what's the enemy? What is it that what we need mind control for? Because the enemy is kama. The enemy is desire in, the, in that uh, more comic sense of the word. Um, and he mentions, which is very interesting, and kind of, you know, shakes us a bit. He said, look, desire, which envelops the entire globe, desire is not only relevant to the man of passion, but the man, of, man or woman of knowledge also is subject to this perverse force. Furthermore, it even will invade and overthrow the, person, the man and woman of discrimination. In other words, even someone who's Buddhic, buddhic, very buddhic, has to be vigilant, has to be aware, has to be alert, and self-correct, re-establish equilibrium, re-establish harmony with the higher. Um, so this self-governance is extremely important. Um, but it begins with rendering service in one's particular orbit. That teaches you a lot about human nature and a lot about karma. Um, and then, you know, strong search. That's what I mentioned about this being an instant sangha, an instant community, because it's the people who are searching. We don't have answers as much as we have questions and, and hypotheses, but it's extremely important to sustain it. Now, the, the thing about the, the example, this is a, absolutely a true story. Um, uh, I was, when I was at the university, UCSB, uh, and I was coordinator of a center there, um, uh, the, the secretary came to me one day and knocked on the door and said, Jim, there's a student here who wants to speak to you. And she says she has a special problem she hopes you can help her with. I said, hmm, special problem. Well, I'm not sure, but go ahead. I, I want to be gracious and let her in and I'll see. So she came in and she sat down and she says, well, she says, I, I have a problem. I said, well, before you say anything further, do you mind if I ask you some questions because I don't know you and you seem to have a, a very genuine deep concern. So I need to find out a little bit more about you. Is that all right? She said, yes, of course. I said, can you just, are, you're a student at UCSB, what year? She said, oh, I'm a junior. I said, okay. I said, how many, and she said her name was Stephanie. I said, now Stephanie, how many classes, units are you taking? She said, I'm taking 21. And I said, you're taking 21? This is a quarter system we're on. 21 units? She said, yes, yes, I take 21. I said, what are they, if I might ask? So she wrote, you know, biochemistry, advanced mathematics, advanced chem advanced physics, so forth. And she just rattled off these courses. I said, that's a incredible, that's a incredible load. I said, you must be a very good student. She says, yeah, I, I, I'm an A student. I said, how'd you do in high school? She said, oh, I was an A student. I was a valedictorian. I said, have you ever made less than an A, Stephanie? She said, no, I've never made less than A, but that's not why I'm here, sir. I said, okay, I just wanted to know. So she said, uh, see, the question I have is, do you think, and you can tell me this honestly, honestly, 
do you think that perhaps I'm a little strange? And I kind of, this kind of took me by surprise. And I said, well, I don't quite know what you mean by the question. She says, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention something to you. I said, what's that? She said, I'm also studying Russian. So in addition to my 21 units, I'm a student of Russian and I've been doing it for the last year. I said, that's interesting. Why? She says, well, I'm going to Moscow on my senior year and their lectures are in Russian. So I have to learn Russian and I know two other languages, but this is, is coming along fine. Uh, and now, so now let me tell you what I feel strange about. I said, okay. She says, well, ever since I was a little girl, when I was five, I can remember, whenever I put my mind on something, I became totally absorbed in it to the extent that I wasn't aware of the world around me, but I was very aware of what I was focused on. And I learned to read very early. And to me, the world of literature was life. And then of course I grew older, but now I'm at the university and I'm with a roommate and I'm in a dorm. <laughs> and she said, my roommate, I'll sit down to study. My roommate sits down to study and 20 minutes later, they're up and moving around the room, lying down on the bed, trying to turn on music, having conversations. <laughs> and, and I don't understand people like that. She says, when I sit down to read my books, Three hours is like five minutes. I don't aware of time. And in time, I'm not even aware of what's going on around me, but I'm acutely aware of what I'm studying and what it means and what it might infer about other fields that I'm interested in. So I get deeply involved in the plane of the mind. But when I start being aware of my fellow students in the halls, to them, I seem strange because for them to sit down for 15 minutes is a burden. <laughs> now, am I strange? That was a question to me. And I said, well, Stephanie, may your tribe increase. The truth of the matter is we'd all be envious of you. You must have been a Buddhist in a previous life. That's just a guess on my part. What do I know? But nonetheless, you have high powers of concentration. You're not strange. You're just the, you're just the archetype of what we would all like to be. She says, oh, that is such a relief. <laughs> Thank you so much for leaving me because I just don't know how to deal with the people. And they just say that I'm strange. But now I no longer have to feel that way. So there you have an example of someone whose powers of concentration were just highly developed. She said whenever she put her mind on anything, it was immediate laser-like of focus. Um, and from that, she could expand. And that's the beautiful thing about the quote. We can end on this. Um, but the quote uh, for the mind control, which I found very intriguing, um, owing to the enormous elasticity of the mind, it is capable of tremendous expansion as well as intense focus. You focus and in time you expand. Because when you understand something at its root, and let's remember something about the article of judge. It was not principally about astral de development as you might think. If you look, at one of his things he's talking about after intellection being superficial, the ordinary intellection that is in control of the, of the senses doesn't penetrate very deeply into things. So he said, how do you develop the power of discretion? In other words, how do you awaken the buddhic faculty? If you look, you'll see that in the article. Um, it's what the article is really about. Um, but he goes through to tell us, to teach us something about the effects of emotions and so forth, but it's about developing it. So when we concentrate and we begin to question and concentrate and understand something, that then expands the circumference of our knowledge and understanding. So once you grasp it at the core, it in time envelops in all the circumferences as well. So that's the beauty of understanding something deeply. 
at, at its very root and its very core from the inside out, so to speak. Because like Socrates said, when you really grasp the transcultural meaning of something, when you grasp the human meaning of something, the most universal, encompassing, richest meaning, then you're able to perceive the presence of that reflected in every language, in every culture, in every action. If you really grasp it, and if you really grasp it, you won't have a will problem either. Because when you grasp it, that intuitive flash releases the energy and the will and the desire to express it, to incarnate, to embody it, to salute it, to celebrate it in others, to encourage it. It's an amazing experience when you have a true buddhic laser-like ins insight into something. It reveals like a beautiful lotus hidden in something. You, it reveals the beauty of the many petals of the lotus that drinks in the sun as the voice of the silence teaches us. So mind control leads in ultimately to self-realization and the Atman, which illuminates the buddhi and the manas. So that becomes a wonderful point on which we might end and mention that next week uh, on July 30th, we will consider the rose and the symbolic meaning of the rose. Um, and so we thank you very much for coming. Um, and we thank again Maria for her presentation, uh, her questions and her very precise laying out all the threads of what Judge is trying to teach us. Um, and so thank you again, and we'll see you next week.